Are you talking to me, Metrin? Or to the other participants? Everyone. You can just okay. to say so. Then I will uh, present myself during the presentation, so I let uh, all the other the possibility to present themselves. Sure, Mr. Francis. Maybe Haran, you can give us a brief introduction about the session and what we expect in the session. Thank you. Haran? Okay. I think we can begin the meeting and then the others will come. They can meet us as we proceed. So, Mr. Francesco, take the floor and begin the meeting. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Welcome. So, please interrupt me if in any moment you don't hear me anymore or if you don't see the screen anymore. So, I'm glad that there are so many people interested in the progressive web apps and the Angular. Indeed, there are two topics that I really like. In this session, we will talk about progressive web apps under different perspectives, starting with uh, some theory so that everybody, even uh, people that are not familiar with progressive web apps, can start uh, to get an idea about uh, the benefits uh, and uh, all the, the um, positive features that, that we can use and introduce in our projects with the progressive web apps. Of course, uh, in, uh, during the session, we will see more in the detail how it's possible to create and inject progressive uh, functionalities, features, into an existing uh, Angular application. And how easy it is, uh, using Angular framework, how easy it is uh, to create uh, progressive web apps. Let's say, let's start. Let's, uh, first of all, list uh, some uh, uh, differences between a progressive web app and a native app either Android or iOS. This doesn't want to be a fight nor a competition, just a, a list of concrete differences and benefits that we have while implementing a progressive web app compared to a native app. First of all, we don't need to uh, upload our application to the App or Play Store, so we don't need to uh, uh, wait for uh, approval or any kind of uh, delay for our uh, application to be live. We just uh, deploy to the server and our progressive web apps is just live immediately. Another, okay. Another very important aspect is that we don't have to support multiple uh, versions. We just have one version that is live and that's it. So it's much more easy to maintain progressive web apps. Another aspect, is that the progressive web app typically cost less. So they need a much smaller budget compared to native apps. This is because we can reuse the know-how that we have inside our web team, because we don't need anything specific or anything new in order to be able to implement progressive web applications. And last, progressive web app have 
much, much smaller memory footprint on the device once installed on the device compared to a native app. We will see also later uh, an example about this. Before going further, just a couple of words about me. My name is uh, uh, Roy Ford already said, is uh, Francesco Leardini. I work as a software engineer, consultant, and Angular trainer in Switzerland for a company called Trivadis. But I'm originally for, from Italy. My remote doesn't work, okay. I'm originally from Italy, from a small town in the north of Italy, in front of the Adra coast. This is very nice, especially in summer. Let's start now our journey in a progressive web app world. Let's imagine we are commuting or in any case moving from a place to the office or in any case in a place where there is not a good internet connectivity. So we are reading some website news or just skipping from one blog article to the next and this is typically what happens. So we don't have a reliable internet connection and this is the classical default offline page. Indeed, it's not a very uh, good experience for our users. But uh, thanks to Progress Web Apps, we can provide a much better experience. As a minimum, we can provide a branded offline page. What does it mean? Is that uh, we can provide uh, static content, so colors, uh, fonts, uh, uh, images, or logo of the, our company, so that uh, when the user accesses our website, even though there is no internet connectivity, still the user can recognize the page with our brand logo or eventually even some static uh, uh, information that could be useful. For example, some phone numbers or some uh, uh, static images that uh, might be used if, uh, for example, we are promoting uh, a campaign, uh, if we are uh, implementing uh, an e-commerce website, for example. But with Progressive Web Apps, we can even go a step further. On the right side, we can see the example of Trivago. It's a company that uh, uh, implements a Progressive Web App and uh, offers a labyrinth game. If you access the website a second time and uh, you don't have an internet connectivity, the application lets you play with this game. And then, as soon as uh, the connectivity is restored, the application automatically redirects uh, the user to the uh, originally requested page. So this is a very smart uh, way to keep the attention of the user locked on the website because otherwise uh, we could lose a potential customer, a potential client. And this is possible with progressive web apps. Let's have a, now a small test. This is a screenshot of my Android phone where I installed uh, the progressive web app of Twitter and uh, the native app. Except for the uh, shape, it's uh, almost impossible to it's almost impossible to see the difference between the two. If we open them, we can see that the layout itself is very similar. Uh, except some colors, actually everything is uh, almost the same. I leave you just a couple of seconds to try to guess which one is the native app, left or right, and which one is the progressive web app. Indeed, if you check it, they are all uh, uh, the details and so on, they are almost the same. There are not very big differences. One big difference is the size once installed on the user device. And this, of course, will give you now a very big hint about which one is the progressive web app. As you might probably, after seeing the size, might have guessed, on the right side, we have the progressive web app, and the native, and the left side, we have the native app. But uh, without knowing that and just looking the layout, indeed, it's uh, almost impossible to see any difference. And this is indeed uh, uh, one core uh, goal of uh, progressive web apps, being able to look light and provide an experience that uh, as, is uh, as close as possible to a native app. So after showing some basic uh, benefits of progressive web apps, let's go now a bit more uh, deeper in details and uh, in uh, technical details and see which are the core components at the base of, a progress of any progressive web app. First of all, we have to talk about a service worker. A service worker nothing, is nothing else than a component, a JavaScript component, that uh, is uh, similar to a web worker. It runs on a separate thread from the one used from the, our web application. And this is a good thing, 
because uh, if our service worker crashes or is uh, very slow because he's uh, uh, doing uh, an extremely heavy task, we don't want that uh, this affects in any way our web application. Service worker acts as a proxy between our client web application and the network or the server. So that according to how we implement the caching strategies, that we will see in just a few moments, and how we implement the service worker, it's possible to intercept all the requests that are shipped out of our web application and then eventually provide the response directly from the cache, so from the client without having to go over the network at all. This is why it's possible, thanks to Progressive Web Apps, to provide data even without a client being connected to the network. But let's see now uh, an animation to better understand how the service worker gets installed and how the whole process works. So we make a, re a first request to our web application that has been announced with the Progressive Web App capability. When we ship uh, the response to the client, we also uh, let the client download our service worker. As we say, it's just a JavaScript file. The service worker then gets uh, through the, uh, its own life cycle, so get installed and activated on the client side. And then eventually, according to how we define the caching strategies, the service worker might already cache, so download some data, static data, uh, on the client side, on the cache. So that uh, from this moment on, every future request that we do, in this case, for example, we don't have a, a Wi-Fi connection, we don't have a network connection, we are traveling, for example. So when we make an hour request, the service worker can understand this request and see whether the response might be fetched from the local cache. In that case, will be provided locally without the need to go at all over the network. And we are able in this way to provide the content offline. So to the user without the need to go over the network at all. This we will see later as also big benefits in terms of performance because uh, the cache is local. So the response is absolutely quick and very fast or almost immediate. Another core aspect or core component of a progressive web apps is a file called the web manifest. Web manifest is a JSON file that, uh, need, that um, instructs the, uh, the web, um, the browser agent to tell how our um, progressive web app should be displayed in the browser and once installed on the home screen of the device. Let's see some of the most important properties that we can define in order to make the application installable. Installable means that we can indeed install on the uh, home screen of a user device. And from that moment on, our progressive app will look like exactly as a native app. So that said, first of all, we have to define a name and a short name. The short name is a fallback in case the name is too long and they cannot be used under the icon once installed on the home screen. Very important property is the display. For that, we can use uh, three different values. Browser is not so interesting. It shows just uh, a default uh, layout that uh, we can uh, get when we simply access with our uh, mobile uh, browser, we access any web page. Standalone is much more interesting as a value for this property because, as we can see, we removed uh, some of the UI elements of the browser. In that case, for example, we don't have any more the uh, address bar. And the, the layout looks uh, much more similar to a native app. Lastly, full screen. As the name suggests, the full screen takes the whole screen, device screen space. And this uh, uh, value is more suited for uh, applications that are rich in media, like videos or content rich, or for example, if we provide a, a web app uh, uh, game. So we can provide the full screen space. Start URL allow us to define which is the page that will be displayed every time the user accesses our uh, progress web app. This is important because we don't want uh, that our user uh, access uh, when it access the second time access the lastly uh, pay visited page like about uh, or orders. We want always that uh, starts with maybe the home or in any case always the same page. 
This aspect is also important because when we use a, a native app, we always land on a sort of dashboard or home page. And we can define this initial page thanks to this start URL property. Then we can define a set of icons. As a minimum, Chrome suggested to have at least two sizes icons that are 192 per 192 and 512 per 512. In this case, then Chrome will uh, automatically scale for us uh, the um, icons according to the user's device. But of course, it's a uh, best practice uh, to have a much more resolution, much more uh, sizes, because we can then provide a, a much better, almost a pixel perfect experience for our users. We can see, and this is also very important, that quite new property, we have purpose. This means that we can define and specify a purpose for such an icon. In this case, we give a value of maskable, and then we can provide another value as a fallback. In this case, any. Any is like a wildcard, is like the um, default value for any icon. There is also a third value possible, is a patch. In that case, uh, we say or we want to instruct the web manifest that uh, the icon should be used uh, as a patch. So in a very, very tiny space or when there is not enough space to show the uh, icon in the full width. It's important though to understand what is a maskable icon first, because this is very important once when we wanted to target uh, Android devices for our progressive web app. We should first uh, uh, say that uh, uh, Samsung was the first to introduce a specific uh, shape for the icons on uh, his own devices. Because uh, Samsung, as a manufacturer, wanted to have all icons on the device to be all the same shape, instead of having uh, every uh, app with a different shape. After that, other producers started also to come out with a different shape. And uh, because of this, uh, Android, from the version uh, uh, Oreo, introduced the concept of adaptive icons. Adaptive icons, eigently, actually, they have uh, an icon, and uh, around the icon, we... Uh, sorry, let me plug uh, the... Charger, sorry, otherwise we will uh, interrupt much earlier the presentation. Yeah, perfect. So, Adaptive icons in Android are actually icons that have uh, an extra space around the, the uh, icon itself so that uh, then Android can uh, decide to crop some portions, outer portions of the uh, icons in order to be able to provide the different shapes. That's why from Android Oreo, we can choose a different uh, shape for all the icons of the, of the, on our uh, device. This is good, but it creates a problem if uh, we implement a progressive web app that is not uh, providing maskable icons. Because uh, then our icons would have a white background or might be in some part might be cropped. So we don't show the whole uh, size, the whole shape of our icon as it should be. How can we define maskable icons? We should uh, take our icon and uh, try to uh, Imagine to uh, draw a 40% uh, uh, radius area, so a kind of a circle, and 40% of the width of our of our uh, icon. This will be called the safe area, meaning that no matter which uh, size, which uh, shape will uh, be then displayed on an Android device, uh, this uh, will be for sure displayed. Everything that is outside this uh, safe area might eventually be cropped according to the final shape. There is a, a very cool tool that you can see the link in the top right corner, so Maskable App Editor, that allows you in a very easy way to create maskable icons. You just have to upload your image and then create some padding in order to have your, your um, size, in the, your icon inside the safe area area. Good. Let's see now how we can uh, introduce and speed, speed up our applications thanks to caching strategies. Caching strategies are very important because uh, um, the service worker doesn't know anything about uh, what and how 
should be uh, cached. We have to instruct the service worker about this. And we can do this uh, thanks to caching strategies. This is very important to being able to provide a very fast response. Uh, and also, we have uh, nowadays to keep in mind that uh, mobile traffic, so users that access our web applications through a mobile device are getting more and more compared to the past. We can see from this graphic that in the past year, actually uh, mobile uh, accesses overcome or surpassed even a desktop uh, accesses. And we have to keep this in mind. So we, it's crucial being able to optimize our web apps for mobile devices. No, no, left. And progressive web apps are really good for that. The first caching strategy we will see is called cache first. This uh, is ideal if we want to provide the um, offline first approach and the best performance. Because once the service worker intercepts a request, we go uh, to the cache first and we try to provide from there the response if available. If not, then there will be a fallback and we go over the network as a, a normal um, network request. So not very complex, but it allows us to provide data even once the user is offline and also very, very uh, quick response. So in case our performance uh, is, a, is a crucial criteria. On the opposite side, uh, there is a... Okay, I think someone got my presentation. Can someone confirm that you see my screen or... Yeah, I can view about network first. Okay, okay, because I got the message that uh, I was not presenting anymore. Thank you. Uh, okay, so network first is the other um, geometrical op opposite uh, caching strategy that uh, goes first over the network. And this is good for cases when we want to provide the very latest uh, uh, information. For example, if we implement the web apps the web app that provides uh, information about the share or stock exchange values, we want our users to get the very latest value. And because of this, we can create, uh, uh, implement a network first uh, uh, caching strategy. The benefit of these uh, strategies is that uh, if there is a network uh, available, we go over the network, so our user will get a uh, latest and fresh data. But if there is a timeout or the network is not available, still the service worker can try to provide the data from the cache. So that even though there is no internet connectivity, still the user can benefit from cached data. Of course, we have to keep in mind that the offline users would get uh, some uh, uh, data that is uh, uh, obsolete. So we have, this, we have to keep this in mind in case uh, the uh, very latest data is uh, crucial for our case. Aside these uh, very basic, uh, but still quite powerful strategies, there are other uh, strategies that we can implement. One is a very interesting, it's called a stale while revalidate strategy. And this is a sort of key hybrid among two. We go first uh, over the network and, uh, so, sorry, we go through the service worker and we provide uh, the, the response uh, straight from the cache. So this gives the benefit of a very quick response. But in the, in the meantime, so in the background, the service worker also goes over the network and checks whether the cached assets are eventually new or there is a newer version on the networks. And if this is the case, then it will download it and then update the cached version. So that the next time we request the same page or the same assets, then the service worker can provide a newer version from the cache. So newer ver version and very fast because we provide it from the cache. If we look at the code to implement this kind of strategy, we can see that it's a little bit more complex compared to the previous two. Still, not uh, not very complex, but we have to provide some uh, lines of code to implement it. But uh, thanks for us, uh, there are tools that uh, leverage uh, this uh, complexity and allow us uh, to concentrate only on the business logic and not on these uh, caching details. One of these uh, tools is called Workbox. Workbox is a uh, open source project from Google and it consists in a set of uh, uh, libraries and uh, mod modules uh, that uh, make it very easy to cache assets. 
how does it work? When we uh, install uh, the library, of course, uh, then we can define routes uh, by registering uh, routes uh, with uh, uh, strings or, uh, like in this case, uh, uh, regular expressions that target the assets that we want to cache. In this case, JavaScript files and CSS files. And then we can just invoke one method, in this case, stay while revalidate, to implement the, cache, uh, the, the caching strategy that we saw just before. So you can see that we can achieve uh, with just uh, three lines of code, all the caching strategies that of course is also optimized by the Google team. So it's a very convenient product. And nowadays, uh, Workbox is uh, considered the state of art to implement uh, uh, production ready progressive web apps. Another benefit is that the Workbox is a framework agnostic. It means that uh, we can use it for React, for Angular, or for any kind of uh, uh, front-end of JavaScript uh, solution, even vanilla JavaScript, if you want. However, however, we are interested in Angular. And Angular, of course, uh, allow us uh, to implement a very, in a very easy way Service Worker and uh, Progressive Web Apps. Thanks to NGAD the schematic, we can inject uh, a progressive web app capabilities into an existing Angular project. If we execute uh, this command, we can uh, download. So the command will download all the needed files. These files are, for example, the service worker module that will be registered for us. It will be uh, the creation of uh, uh, the web manifest with default values and the set of uh, predefined icons, in this case, the Angular logo. and uh, the service worker configuration file where we can define all the uh, caching strategies as we want. Let's see now the first demo. The demo is uh, very easy and uh, the goal is to show how easily we can build a progressive app with uh, Angular starting from a very easy uh, and basic uh, Angular project. So let me switch the screen. And So, this is uh, our. This is our project. As I said, uh, we can see that uh, once we install or execute this uh, command, uh, Angular for us uh, downloads uh, the service worker module and register the service worker file. It's important to note that uh, this is the real service worker implementation, and. Uh, and uh, uh, it uh, is stored in the node modules folder. This is important to know because we cannot manually alter or edit this file. Otherwise, every time we make a production build, and we can see here that uh, our service worker will be registered only when we have a, a production build, Sorry, is a file we, yeah? Okay, maybe a slight interruption. We cannot view a screen. You are not presenting. Okay. it's a. Let me. Okay, I have uh, Windows the Windows uh, Share. Okay, no problem. I will open. It. Okay. Not very ideal. I thought uh, that I could use uh, two screens. It will take a bit of time later, but okay. It's a pity that uh, with uh, Chrome uh, meetings, I cannot uh, share multiple uh, uh, desktop screens. But now you should be, I'm uh, now sharing the same one. You should be able to see my visual code. Uh, still not, huh? wait. Let me change them. Oh, not even the same screen. That's quite unfortunate. Okay, well then, we make uh, the hard way. Okay. So. Cool. Now you should be able to see my visual code. Yeah, it's, it's visible uh, now. It's Perfect. It's okay. not uh, really easy to share screens, especially with uh, different uh, Windows uh, desktop, but okay, we will uh, go step by step anyway. 
So Maybe. as I said before, sorry, yeah. Okay, you can zoom it a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Great. Uh, good. So as I said, with this uh, NGAT schematic, so Angular slash PWA, mm -hmm. Angular CLI does a lot of things for us. First of all, it downloads the service worker module and registers the service worker file. This is the file I said before that will be stored in the node modules. So we cannot change this because this file is overwritten every time we make a build. Another thing is that in the index.ml, we can see that we, or the command, register the web manifest for us and define the theme color for our application when we will launch it. We will see later in the demo how it look like. It creates a, a, the web manifest with a set of default values. We can, of course, change the name, colors, and everything as we want. But this command already creates this for us and is in a good way. We can also see that we have a multiple image size that are created and made available for us out of the box. But much more interesting is this file, ngswconfig.json. This file, the name stands for Angular Service Worker Configuration file. In here, and this is the default uh, um, uh, lines of the default setup that we get once we execute this command, we can see that we have uh, a asset groups property with uh, two objects, one called app and the other one called assets. In the first one, so app with, with the install mode prefetch, we define files that are composing the core of our application, meaning that we want to store here the files while the service worker is installing, meaning that as soon as then the service worker is installed, the user can, offline, can access our web application and get these files so that uh, all these files will, for example, give uh, this uh, branded uh, uh, offline page, as we saw before. And because of this, we have to use install mode prefetch, meaning indeed, uh, or telling the uh, service worker to install or download uh, these uh, assets while is still installing. It's important to note that uh, if we put uh, too big files or too many files, and uh, even one of them fails uh, to be downloaded, then the whole uh, service worker installation step and process will be uh, aborted and it will start again next time the user uh, access the page or refreshes the page but good to keep in mind the second group is called assets you can see here install mode is lazy lazy means that we want to fetch these assets only if the user uh, downloads or uh, needs them request them at least once and then update mode is a prefetch Prefetch for the update mode means uh, tells the user, the service worker, to fetch a newer version of the of these uh, assets as soon as uh, is detected a new version on the server. So immediately is available. We can even provide a value of lazy for the update mode, meaning that then we will update the cache version, but only if the user again requests the second time it. So not in an eager way. So. This as a groups as a groups uh, uh, property is uh, created by default uh, with this command and uh, is responsible to cache some uh, uh, static files. But Angular gives us the possibility to cache also API GET requests, and we can see now how. We have to define another property array type called data groups. In here, we can define different caching uh, um, kinds uh, with different strategies and uh, we can give as a target different URLs. Let's start uh, looking at the first one. We can see within the cache config object that we define a strategy performance. Performance uh, is, uh, the, in the, is the angular uh, cache first strategy as we saw before. Meaning that uh, we want to provide the data straight from the cache because we want to provide a very quick response. We can define also how many uh, responses to keep in the cache and for how long. At this time, then we needed to uh, fetch again these assets in the cache. And here is our uh, URL. It's an URL that provides a random uh, uh, jokes uh, just for the sake of, uh, of this demo. 
The second object uh, uh, targets uh, two URLs that provide uh, random images of uh, cats. We are a good fan of cats, so we can say, oh, I want always to have the very latest uh, image of a new cat. But in a real case scenario, we can uh, think about uh, this uh, gives uh, uh, the latest uh, values of the shares for Microsoft or stock exchange values of uh, Apple, for example. In this case, we want to provide uh, uh, strategy freshness. So this is a network first, as we saw before, but in Angular it's called freshness. And this uh, will go straight over the network. And then you can see here, we can define a timeout. Five seconds, one minute, probably is too much. Meaning that if uh, this uh, timeout occurs while trying to uh, fetch this uh, request, then uh, the service worker will try to provide uh, the response for the cache. Of course, if there is a cached version. We can again uh, provide uh, uh, how many uh, responses to keep in the cache and for how long. But this is everything we have to do to implement uh, a progressive app. And as we see, unless we wanted to cache some uh, um, API get requests or responses, we are good to go with just that command. And let's see now how does it look like. to open it again. It's a pity that uh, every time I want to switch the presentation, it does not keep uh, the window. Maybe let me try this. No. OK, every time we have to switch, but fair enough. Okay, so you should be able to see now the um, the application how it would look like. Is a as I said, it's a very simple application. Actually, ninety percent of it is just uh, what comes out if you make an engine new uh, application with the uh, Angular CLI to show once more how easy it is uh, to create a progressive web app with Angular. And then we execute this command. In this case, we uh, cache all the assets with this. Uh, first uh, uh, property and then we cache the responses of uh, the two uh, endpoints so on the left side is the joke that uh, uses the performance strategy and the right side is the freshness if we open the uh, chrome dev tools you will zoom a little bit okay in the application tab on the left side on the manifest, we can see a user-friendly uh, list of all our web manifest uh, properties. But important is uh, the, ser the service worker label because it uh, tells information, tells us information about the service worker. In this case, we can see that uh, our service worker is uh, uh, activated and is running for our domain. Now, if we switch uh, to the network tab and I refresh the page, we can see that uh, the, uh, the jokes uh, endpoint is uh, provided by the service worker. We don't go over the network. And we can also see that joke indeed remain the same. While the um, freshness endpoint goes over the network. Now, if I go offline and I refresh the page, first of all, we can see that not only all our assets, even though I am now offline, are provided and uh, they are still working, but also our content that are provided from uh, the two APIs. And if we look at more closely now to the network tab, we can see that uh, either the uh, joke API and the cat's uh, uh, API search, both are provided from the service worker. So this is the fallback for the freshness strategy. It's a great uh, way to provide the data, not only uh, static, but also eventually dynamic uh, with uh, uh, Angular and with the progressive web apps when our users are offline. So we go online again, we refresh the page, and uh, we can see that uh, the joke comes again from the cache, but now we have a new, as expected, a new uh, image because it's a freshness strategy. The uh, uh, ngswjson file is an important file that uh, every time is downloaded. And if you look at it, it uh, has a 
a Nash table with all the cached uh, assets and a Nash value for it. This is uh, the way that the service worker can use in order to detect whether there is a newer version of it or not. If uh, we have a buggy version of our uh, PWA and we want, for example, to uh, let the service worker be automatically uninstalled and also all the cache uh, value be un uninstalled from the, from the clients that uh, installed it, we have to deploy our progressive web app without uh, this file. In that case, uh, then automatically not only our service worker will be deleted, but also the cache storage will be empty where all our assets are. We can now um, simulate it. I will, in my application distribution folder, I will delete uh, this uh, ngsw file. Yes, delete it. And then in here, I will refresh it. page and what I would expect is that uh, he's not able to find it. it takes a bit of time exactly you see it fails in get it and now if I open the application tab we can see that the cache store storage is empty and our service worker is deleted you see so this is kind of a uh, um, safe or parachute uh, mechanism we have uh, to uh, wipe the, all the cached uh, data and the service worker for our clients in case we have a buggy version of it okay let's uh, go back to our presentation let me go back to the same slide and share again the screen Okay. Good. So now you should be able the same slide where we left before. This is the uh, GitHub uh, address that you can access if you wanted to play with it or just uh, download it. Uh, Service Worker uses uh, the Cache API in order to uh, uh, cache the data locally. But the cache API is the limitation that we can only store locally or cache, only get calls. But what about if we wanted to eventually store also a put or post requests? This is not possible automatically or out of the box with the cache API. We should eventually implement a, um, a custom solution, for example, implementing an index DB that uh, stores there everything uh, uh, while the user is offline, so that uh, when we detect that the connectivity is restored again, our application goes over all the recorded entries uh, of uh, inside the index DB and start to trigger them in order. Not very complex, but it takes quite some time to plan it in a proper way and uh, to implement it. But once again, there are other tools that we can use that uh, leverage the complexity or uh, avoid the complexity for us and uh, make us uh, concentrate only on the business logic. One of these is called the uh, Cloud Firestore. Cloud Firestore is a NoSQL uh, uh, database uh, service provided by Firebase. Firebase platform is a, a Google solution or platform that provides a set of uh, services for web development and uh, uh, native development. But uh, for this, uh, we uh, for this case for this session, we concentrate only on the Cloud Firestore because uh, this uh, NoSQL database provides a very interesting uh, uh, feature, and this is called uh, uh, offline persistence. Once we download uh, this uh, library and uh, we invoke the enable persistent wow. method, what uh, Firestore does is that to, for every request to a document, so to be the page uh, details of a user, the details of a hoarder, yeah. so some content that is uh, stored in this uh, NoSQL uh, database, uh -huh. from this moment on, this uh, document is uh, persisted locally in an yeah. index DB and uh, it's made available also once the user is offline. And this is done completely transparent for the user. Uh, while offline, the user can still access these documents, change them and delete them. And then as soon as it goes 
online again, Cloud Firestore yeah, automatically will that. detect all these uh, pending changes and oh, upload fine. them to the server so that all the other clients that are connected uh, or using the same uh, uh, database will uh, receive uh, automatically these uh, uh, updates without having to do any poll. Let's see now an example, a little bit more complex of an Angular progress web app application that uh, uses a clou uh, Cloud Firestore as a NoSQL database with offline persistence. And we will see with this demo how it's possible to create an application that is uh, uh, completely seamless for our users. So our users will be able will be able to use our application offline and online, but without absolutely any difference. Let me switch again. Now, presentation. Now, so I fear that uh, you can see only my Chrome, and uh, I wanted to show also the, at the same time the emulator of my phone because that's the real cool part. But uh, I guess, uh, yeah, unfortunately. Let me see if uh, with the other feature or with the other uh, option I can present the whole screen instead of just. Uh, Okay, so this is cool. What you can see is that on the left side is the demo application that we will uh, just uh, describe in a few seconds, and on the right side is an emulation of my phone. All these uh, four icons that you can see are progressive web apps that I implement. If uh, I open all the application uh, currently uh, active on my screen, you can see that uh, our uh, progressive web app, so this OPR tab, is uh, opening a separate tab, not in the same Chrome uh, tab. This is because uh, we used uh, the um, displayed standalone property, if you remember before, in the web manifest. So allows uh, the progressive app to be open in a separate standalone app on the device, giving uh, once more uh, the feeling of a native app. Another important aspect of Progressive Web App is that these have to be responsive. So you can see that on the left side on a, um, on a uh, browser, we have uh, three or more, according to the space, uh, columns. While on the left side, we have uh, is a mobile, so we have not much space, we have just one column. Plus, uh, the label aside the icons just uh, disappears on mobile device because we want to optimize in a responsive way the space. Just a few words about uh, this application. This application is uh, uh, a project, a personal project of me that uh, I keep uh, to keep track of all nice restaurants or places, bars that I eat, that I see and I want to keep track while traveling. So the nice thing is that uh, using a cloud Firestore, if now I uh, implement it, I, sorry, I edit it on one client and I save it, we can see that uh, this uh, save is automatically propagated uh, through Cloud Firestore to all the other clients. In this case, uh, the, uh, the uh, mobile client. This is uh, a feature, another cool feature of uh, Cloud Firestore. But now let's see the real full power or progressive web app and offline storage. I go in a, a airplane mode, so I go completely offline. And still I can refresh the page. Our uh, application is a progressive web app, so I get all my contact. And I can even edit a, a document that I didn't have uh, open before. So here I write uh, edit, for example, I save it and then we can see that uh, on the right side, so on our client, we have uh, this uh, uh, record edited, but nothing on the left side. And this is uh, because uh, we are offline with our phone. We are traveling and so on. So 
Now, if I switch off my airplane mode, so I will go online again, what I would expect is that uh, this uh, Osteria La Churma uh, record will be updated automatically for us here. This is because uh, Cloud Firestore detects this pending change and will synchronize for us this change. So I go online again. Sorry. And then according to how fast is my uh, connection at the moment, uh, yeah, now, we see that uh, this uh, change has been propagated on the left side. This is extremely cool, and as you saw from the slide, we just need uh, one line of code to achieve that. This is the real nice thing of uh, using these modern technologies together. We can really achieve uh, really powerful uh, uh, results. So before wrapping back up, I wanted again to um, point the attention that we were offline and still the usability of our web application on a mobile device even when we are offline was exactly the same as uh, while we are online. So we were able to uh, open and check the details of a, of a restaurant in this case or in the case of a document. We can change it, we can uh, do everything. And the user absolutely has no clue being online or being uh, offline. Oh, that, that got fast. Now, a lot of time I get the same question. So, oh, okay, cool. PayWA are really a nice uh, functionality, a nice uh, technology. Then we should go and get rid of uh, our native apps. Well. It depends on the cases because the progressive app still have uh, other limits. One of them is that uh, uh, many of the functionalities of progressive web app are still not uh, fully supported by or iOS devices. For example, web notifications. So if we want to target also these uh, devices, we have to keep this in mind. On the other side, uh, progressive web apps can do only what uh, web applications can do. For example, we cannot access the contact list on the user device. Even though the new uh, APIs are coming out, even though it's still experimental. For example, contact picker API from Google that allows these and uh, close these kind of gaps. Before finishing my talk, I want to leave you some uh, uh, links uh, to resources that uh, can give you a lot of information, more information about progressive web apps. The first two, PWA Rocks and AppScope, are kind of a gallery of uh, very cool uh, applications uh, done with the progressive web app. So you can uh, get uh, inspired by uh, other developers that uh, use the progressive web app to create really nice uh, uh, web apps, really nice applications. The third one, pwstats.com, is a set of uh, successful stories that uh, show how can uh, uh, Progressive Web App can benefit uh, different uh, companies belonging to different uh, domains. And the last two um, links are more kind of educational, or in any case, uh, the first one, is, uh, SO stands for Stack Overflow PWA a website, collects all the um, most visited the Stack Overflow requests about uh, questions about uh, progressive web app or service workers. And what PW can do shows a gallery of functionalities that uh, are today possible with the progressive web apps. So I leave you these uh, links to uh, stimulate even more the appetite to get deeper and learn more about progressive web apps. That said, I really thank you for the attention. I hope uh, you find uh, my talk interesting and you could learn uh, new things about Angular and uh, about the progressive web apps. If you are interested, you can follow me on Twitter, well, where regularly I post uh, code snippets or uh, new uh, updates about the articles that uh, sometimes I write on uh, dev.to uh, portal or on other kind of uh, information about uh, technologies and uh, web in general. That's it. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm done. So Roy Ford, or you can take from here if there are questions or if you want to wrap it up. All right. Thank you. Uh, on the chat box, there are several questions. I can see two. Uh, hmm. uh, OK, OK, OK. <coughs> 
the first question goes here about how do you cache an API call? Yeah, how do you cache an API call? Mm -hmm. That we, we saw before, let me so show uh, share again the, the code. So you have to define a um, So you have to define a, in this uh, ngsw config file that is automatically created when you uh, use the ngad schematics angular slash pwa command. Within this file, you have uh, to create uh, this uh, data groups uh, array. And in here, so let's uh, minimize this. In here, you can define one or more objects. and within the URLs uh, uh, array, you can define which is the uh, URL or the API that you want uh, to cache. So that this means that uh, when the, um, your application, when uh, your application makes a request, uh, so a get to this endpoint, uh, Royford, can you please mute the mic? Thank you. So when uh, your uh, web app makes a GET request to this API, the service worker knows that uh, he has uh, to use the strategy performance in this case and uh, cache the response that comes back uh, from this, uh, from this uh, uh, API. So this is uh, the way you can follow in order to... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Cash uh, API response. <laughs> Is there any other question? All right. Another question is here yeah, by someone request you to share the links where maybe you, we can find the code. So I can request you to paste them on the chat box so that they can access sure. them. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I will uh, share uh, uh, not only the slides, uh, but also the the GitHub uh, repo. So you have there the demo and play with, uh, as we saw, and also the code you can fork it and uh, extend uh, locally. Then if you have uh, questions in the next days, you can even uh, reach me on Twitter if you want. Hello? Okay, right. then uh, thank you very much, uh, Royford and Harbon, to organize and to invite me to this uh, session. Thank you, everybody, the attendees, uh, for being so interested and uh, for all the uh, compliments or, in any case, uh, for greetings. Really pleased uh, to be here and share with you all uh, these uh, concepts. <laughs> Maybe I think someone, Brian, Brian is speaking. Kindly, Brian, be louder and uh, unmute your mic and speak. Okay, hello, I'm Brian. Huh? Hi. Yes, I'm asking if you can implement some data algorithm in the cache API. I think uh, you mean it? Mm -hmm. If you uh, can which, implement yeah. some data structure. I think algorithms in the cache API. Yeah, uh, at the moment, uh, if you want to customize uh, some actions uh, while the service worker is installed, uh, or if you want uh, to, um, along the life cycle of steps of a service worker with uh, Angular, it's uh, still not really easy to do. Uh, I talked with Igor Minar uh, last year in the Angular Connect conference, and he told me that uh, they are uh, they wish to uh, extend this uh, current uh, functionality of uh, service worker in Angular, but at the moment is like a black box. So it's very easy to implement it, but then if uh, you need some extra and a bit more advanced. Uh, uh, way is not exactly possible like this uh, out of the box. You can still cache uh, static assets or API responses, but otherwise, uh, if you want, for example, to interact uh, directly with the cache API and uh, eventually to do something uh, with uh, data structures, for example, uh, uh, exchange uh, or do something with the cache data that you have uh, locally, 
then uh, I would suggest uh, rather to use a workbox that allows you much more freedom about it. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. All right, maybe any any other person with a question? Matron? Any other question, please? If there are no other questions, I want to thank our guest who gave his vital time for from his business schedule to grace the meeting and to thank everyone for humbling your time to join the session. Yeah. I want to say thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Matrin. Thank you everybody and uh, once again enjoy Angular and the uh, progressive web apps. Bye guys, have a safe and a nice evening. Nice evening, sir. We shall interact more on Twitter and other sessions. Nice to hold you another yep. session. Thank you. All right. Bye.